anyway, nothing's perfect, until finally, after a year of this, one is perfect. And that's this. It looks a lot like Jurassic Park once you actually get there. That was my first impression anyway. And it's like, when you first step out of the car and you know you're there and it feels right, I mean, that happens in a lot of different businesses, like whether it's a product development, R&D, or whatever. When you hit the right formula or you come to the right you know, configuration of something, you just know that it's the right one. We all got that feeling the first minute we saw this place. But of course, way out of our price range. I mean, we're a, a you know, lean startup. We have no money to work with, basically, at the very start. So we're thinking, you know, we have to find something that's modestly priced. But that feeling was just overpowering. So the first thing that jumped through my head was not, we can't afford this. It was, how do we afford this? <laughs> and I guess clowning around at the Gulch Gulch project told me and showed me through experience that people will join you and support you if you show them something worth supporting. So we basically employed a lot of the same methodology. And we got members in, one at a time, slowly, that wanted to help us make this happen. So it's sort of like the crowdfunding model applied to real estate. The Rolls-Royce motto or whatever is like, take the best that exists and make it better. Or if it doesn't exist, invent it. Unfortunately, we had to go with the latter route and just do it ourselves. And the reason for that is that I'm kind of one of those weird artistic types that likes you know, time to think and create and stuff like that. And when you have to hold down a normal job, it makes that process really tricky. If you're trying to write a book or play music with friends in a band or whatever. And then, oh, I got to go to work. No, sorry. So the whole point of this was to just provide something minimal that takes care of your needs, your shelter, your, your support system. The idea is you just pay it off and it's done. You don't have to worry about that. We've actually had a lot of very different people that we never would have thought come forward. Like, we tend to be fairly libertarian, conservatively minded type people. And we've had all kinds of like socialist hippie types come in and say, whoa, this is awesome, you know, because like we share a lot of these common values. We all love to use Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and stuff. And that, that appeals across the whole board. We love open sourcing things. And uh, one of the lessons from the failed Gulch Gulch project was that we have, to, we have to do basically the opposite of what they did in the sense of instead of trying to keep everything covered up and like trying to manage all the problems by yourself, we, we kind of flipped the script and we're like, OK, this is an open community project. This is not just like customers and a provider. This is all of our projects. We're just kind of facilitating the birthing process. So it's kind of nice because now if something goes wrong, it's not all just our fault. You know, it's like it's a it's a group effort. So if something starts looking weird for some reason, maybe there's a problem with the land or accounting or the government passes a law or you know anything that comes up, we can face it together as a group in an open fashion. And there's none of this. Oh. You promised us something you're not delivering, et cetera, et cetera. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at Get getcell411.com. That's getcell411.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on the seeds of liberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. So Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the Bipcot No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bipcot.org. So today I'm pleased to have a returning guest, Gabriel Shear, coming in from uh, Valdivia, right? Valdivia, yeah. Valdivia, Chile. Um, and he's going to talk to us about what's been, what he's up to in Chile um, with uh, what's called the Crypt Academy, uh, as well as his, uh, his community project, Fort Galt. And his recent addition to the family, um, 
which was an illegal home birth, which is, isn't that amazing? You know, you're trying to have a, trying to birth your baby safe and sound, and it's just, you're breaking the law. You're a criminal. You're just, you're just a criminal, and you deserve to go to jail. So <laughs> that, and perhaps touch on uh, the idea of mandatory vaccinations and, uh, and the, um, you know, philosophy behind that and why some people oppose it, uh, as well as perhaps Jordan Peterson and uh, the waves that he's making in uh in the uh the anarchist community and volunteers community so uh gabe thanks a lot for coming back on the show yeah it's good to see you again it's been a while yes it has and i'm sure you've been busy you don't seem like the uh the uh idol type of guy (laughs) no i think last time i was in an apartment in valdivia like in the middle of town Mm -hmm. and we were yeah i think we had like we had found the land for Fort Galt, but nothing much had started there yet, and we we didn't have the funding together or anything like that. It, it was very early in the process. And so since then, I mean, a lot has happened. We've got a bunch of new members on board, and we've actually broken ground now. And, uh, I mean, things are rolling, and it's <laughs> it's it's fun to be at that more active stage, right, where things are starting to materialize more. And then also, like, as you mentioned, Crypt Academy, that's another uh, building that's going up on the same site where, you know, we're hoping to put together this school to teach the locals more about, you know, cryptocurrency and blockchain tech and all that fun stuff. And yeah, definitely staying busy. And also, as you mentioned, had a baby. So that's fun, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. So maybe, um, yeah, let's first get into Fort Gold. So so maybe just remind, explain to people what it's about and what are your, you know, what are your goals with it? Um, so are people living there now or, or just... No one's living on site yet, no. We're generally just kind of clustering around Valdivia, renting apartments and, you know, it, it's it's close enough that we can go out to the build site whenever we're needed and, and things like that. But no, we, we aren't actually living on site. Hopefully that'll happen later this year. But yeah, I mean... As you already know, I was kind of lured down here to Chile uh, after seeing advertisements for kind of a similar community project that was specifically marketed towards libertarians. That was kind of close to Santiago. I I think I started seeing those uh, in 2012 or so. And throughout 2013, I was basically making plans to come down. And by 2014, the beginning of it, I finally made it and showed up and volunteered to help out and within a couple months it was pretty clear that it was all a scam so had to basically stop and take stock of myself and say well now what wait wait and so you're, you're referring to Gold's Gulch right yeah okay. Gold's Gulch Chile yeah okay. I'm sure anyone in libertarian land knows what that is and what yep. happened with that so they were essentially uh, selling plots of land that were not legally inscribed the subdivisions didn't exist Hmm. so they were selling something they didn't have to sell Hmm. and libertarians of course being the trusting wide-eyed dreamers that we are you know a lot of people bought into that and i think Hmm. 10 million dollars went down the drain so a lot of hard lessons were learned with that and i guess i was fortunate in a way to have a front row seat because i got to learn a lot of the things that do work and obviously don't work in real estate Hmm. So a friend of mine that I met at the Exosphere Entrepreneurship Boot Camp, uh, he called me up as all this was transpiring and offered to come down and pitch in and kind of take the idea back to the drawing board and do a smaller version of it. So we teamed up, uh, four of us partners, and started exploring Chile. We found a great piece of land down here by Valdivia finally and have just been chipping away at bringing this t- together. We started essentially with nothing. I mean, we just had crazy ideas and the loose idea that there were other dreamers like us out there that would want to take part in it. And so it was just a long process of throwing ideas out there and getting feedback, you know, and then modifying the ideas and designs for buildings and things like that. It was, you know, a long gradual process. Of course, dealing with anything you know legal down here is a whole process in itself. Every little step takes forever, and Chileans love their bureaucracy, so everything has to be stamped and signed a million times by everyone and his brother. And <laughs> so it's just all, I mean, it's insanely educational. I do recommend that anyone who's interested in this kind of stuff try it on a small scale, preferably, mm-hmm. and you know get your feet wet and just gather some experience because you learn a lot just by doing. And especially with anarchists and libertarians like us, you know, a lot of the ideas that we like to toss around in debate have to do with how to 
live with each other, how to manage communities and organize ourselves and things like that. So, you know, before you try to change the world, as they say, I hate that phrase, but <laughs> before you try to like rework the whole world around you, take a page from Jordan Peterson, right? Clean your room, start on the small scale, yeah, you know, yeah. and you'll learn a lot from that. And just, you know, it doesn't have to be big, just, you know, a small community of your friends and neighbors, you know, you'll, you'll have to deal with everything that the state deals with on a smaller scale, everything about, you know, conflict resolution and how to, you know, build the roads and build a wall and <laughs> all that fun stuff. So yeah, that's just what we've been doing. It's, it's been this great big sandbox and we've just been having a good time, but also, I mean, there are trials and tribulations that go along with it. And you just learn by doing, and holy crap, we've learned a lot. So, so the people so, that you're attracting are they all anarchist volunteers, or just people who want to? Yeah, and that's play? that was kind of a funny process too. Is like we started off with language on our website and in our marketing material and things like that that was that was very uh, compatible, let's say, with libertarians, and we used a lot of like Randian type language and stuff like that. <laughs> purposefully to attract that sort of person because that's that's what we had in mind at first that's why we came down that's why we were attracted to gulch gulch but one of the you know flip side i mean there were some great things we learned from gulch gulch and there were some important but negative things too and that was that the political charge the ideology that goes with it and everything that has no place in real estate <laughs> hmm. i mean it's almost a contamination because it attracts people who think that they'll fit simply because they think a certain way about certain issues. And it usually has nothing to do with how trustworthy they are, how productive they are, how solid their characters are, anything like that. It's just, oh, I love freedoms. I don't like the state, so I'll fit in with you naturally, right? Mm. Not the case. Libertarianism is full of weirdos. <laughs> Anyone who's been around it definitely knows that. Anyone who's been to Porkfest or Anarchapogo or whatever, <laughs> you meet some great people, but you meet some total wingnuts too. And, you know, we, we figured out that we need we need a better model to kind of help people self screen themselves, you know? So we gradually changed our language to focus more on entrepreneurship. It's, it's not just a place for libertarians. In fact, we've stripped all of the libertarian anarcho Randian language out of our marketing material and everything. It's strictly geared towards productive freelancers, entrepreneurs, people who have their own business or are self-sufficient because that separates the men from the boys, so to speak, right? There's there's a lot of people who are like armchair philosophers that really haven't gone out there and learned the hard lessons yet. And just that life experience really does build your character and make you a more reliable, trustworthy person, generally speaking. And if you've left your home country, or at least are willing to leave your home country to start a business in a foreign land and things like that, like you have to kind of be a libertarian anyway, even if you don't use that language. Hmm. I mean, we we encountered a lot of people through Exosphere, for instance, who were self-proclaimed socialists. And when you like we sat down with them and of course we argued about, you know, who will build the roads and all that classic crap. <laughs> but after a bit of conversation, we quickly learned that, you know what, they talk the talk of socialism, but in practice, they're just as anarchist as I am. <laughs> This one guy, for instance, he's he was from Argentina, but he was working online doing coding for an American company and not paying taxes. So we're like, ha, gotcha. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Since then, he's joined us and he bought a room at Fort Galt and he's one of the family. So, <laughs> so awesome. the, the, the political language can be kind of a hang up. It, it can kind of get in the way. Mm. You know, it's it's the practice that you really got to focus on. Yeah, it's so, it's so true that uh, you know people call themselves one thing, but then once you start talking to them, you, you talk about philosophy, morality, and economics, and they <laughs> understand those basics, and you're like, all right, well, if you don't like the word anarchism, we, you don't have to use it, but <laughs> essentially, <laughs> yeah, that's what you are. And I found like it, it goes the other way too. People who self-identify as libertarians or anarchists or whatever, like that label is not all that useful to me, honestly, because there's so many subjects that are that have to kind of be vetted or, or compared with each other to see if you actually match. Like, okay, you like drugs. Great. Does that make you a libertarian just because you don't <laughs> like the state getting in the way of your weed? <laughs> 
that's not enough, bro. Come on. <laughs> so it's like, I just don't even care if you call yourself a libertarian now. It, that word has lost all its meaning to me, essentially. I mean, relatively speaking, you know, you don't like state I- interference. That's great. Fine. Whatever. But I mean, anarchism is more than just about statism or not, as far as I'm concerned. It's it's authoritarianism comes in other forms, you know. There are illegitimate authority figures besides just the state. It's a mindset. It's a philosophy. Yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's great that you're. You know, you, you know, you say there are certain people that are more armchair philosophers, <laughs> and espouse this stuff only behind the keyboard, and uh, and that's it, <clears throat> and that's not enough. Um, but you know, and that's why it's great what you do. You know, you're actually going out and you're you're living it. You're you're you know transacting in it you're just um espousing it constantly in your daily life and that's so cool um so yeah so go into a little bit of what uh crypto 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 academy and you said exosphere is that related to crypto academy no well we we learned a lot of interesting lessons from exosphere that i guess kind of transfer over to crypto academy but exosphere is it's an entrepreneurship boot camp and it was set up um, on the coast here of Vina del Mar, and this was back in 2014. And it was a three-month-long boot camp program that I participated in as soon as I got to Chile, and that's where I met the people that turned into my business partners. That's mm-hmm. Luke and Lourdes Crowley. Mm-hmm. They were participants in that program also. And then having kind of gone through all the course material and the little experiences along the way and things like that, we got to kind of realize that we worked well together for the most part. And we thought along the same lines about most things. And so after it was all said and done, I guess it just made sense that we could work in the real world together too. So, Mm. but I mean, they focus a lot there on, um, building your, your character and your personal development. And it's not just like business school, you know, Mm. most People kind of get attracted to it for that reason, thinking that they'll just learn business skills. But, I mean, there's a lot of foundational personal work that has to go on for the business skills to even matter, right? Mm -hmm. So that was fun. And they've since expanded. Uh, I went and visited them last August in Florianopolis, Brazil. They were set up doing a program there. Uh, They had kind of streamlined it and shortened it up, and it was was a lot more fast-paced and, I think, better use of time, honestly. So they're still going strong, and Crypt Academy is essentially the major missing component that I thought Exosphere lacked, because we loved the program, everyone who was there participating in it, but they didn't have any physical infrastructure for themselves. They had to rent a venue, and everyone had to rent their own living quarters and things like that. And at the end of the program, a lot of us didn't want to go home. We just wanted to stay right where we were and keep working on these projects that we were developing and keep working with these new friends that we had just made and stuff and Mm. so we thought wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to go home if there was an infrastructure here somewhere to live where we didn't have to you know clock out at the end of the season or whatever and and if there was a a school building that we could keep using and so essentially fort galt is developing to be the residential answer and crypt academy is kind of the co-working space school wing of that so we're trying to kind of finish the puzzle and if exosphere ever wants to come and use it someday in the future we would be honored to have them as guests so we'll see how that plays out but also i mean just a flexible co-working space like that is insanely useful no matter where you are and i mean there are a couple small ones in in town but none of them are set up very well so hopefully um the rest of the community around valdavia will find value in it too and there's a homeschooling community in the area as well and they, they don't have a proper facility to use either they just kind of meet at each other's houses from time to time and Mm. it's almost like how churches get built you know people start just meeting in each other's houses and then they're they're like you know there's a lot of us now we should probably (laughs) you know have a bigger place for this right so we're kind of building the church for learning you know (laughs) (laughs) the church really i like that um and and i assume you also want to um teach classes in cryptocurrency is that is that the goal as well yeah i mean adoption is key with this crusade that we're on to spread the gospel of cryptocurrency (laughs) and in practice i mean chileans have been very slow to you know use it Mm. it's this weird tech for nerds it's you know i mean we've we've all dealt with the learning curve and trying to explain it to people for the first time and stuff and they're kind of behind the in the game i mean there are some exchanges here which is nice they've they've 
helped out a lot because with Fort Galt, our, our members like to pay with cryptocurrency. And mm -hmm. so it's nice that we actually have an exchange here based in Chile so we can receive payments and convert to pesos and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's been great. But that's about all Chile has going on crypto wise. There, there needs to be more promotion and adoption. So we're hoping to help facilitate that here in this city. And really focus on getting Valdivia caught up, you know, it, it can kind of be Chile's shining example of what a crypto town can look like. So this is one of the programs that we can offer on a regular basis is just for community groups, businesses, individuals, just come on down uh, late morning and by the late afternoon after one day, you'll know everything that we know and you'll be comfortable using cryptos. You'll have wallets set up. You'll be comfortable using exchanges and trading and all that, you know, stuff that we take for granted because we've been using it for a while. But, you know, that learning curve at first is kind of scary for some, especially if they're not tech savvy, which a lot of people aren't like that. They only started using credit cards and debit cards and stuff within, within the last 10 years here. It's hmm. wow. they're a, a little slower to catch on, but hopefully we can help help them kind of leapfrog over a few steps wow so you guys are really like breaking new ground like pioneers down there <laughs> yeah and there's the uh international coin fest that's coming up in april too and so we're kind of coordinating with them that started in vancouver and they have uh parallel events happening all, all over the world and mm -hmm. so we're doing one down here to kind of coincide with that just to kind of stir up the buzz and get some speakers down and put on an event to help people in town kind of start learning about what this is all about. Mm, that's awesome. Great, great. Um, so let's get into your, I'm excited to get into your home birth because I, I, I that's something that I'm passionate about as well. Yeah. Like just, um, you know, homeschooling, home birth, you know, that kind of, although we did, we did a home water birth. Um, nice. so we, we took it to the next level. No. <laughs> So yeah, so uh, I don't yeah. know that uh, that just sounds like more work to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so beautiful. Uh, but but yeah, for, I'll get into it. But but let, let me uh, I'll let you talk about you know what the climate's like in Chile regarding home birth and uh, and how was your experience, you and Tanisha? Yeah, well, as I mentioned before, it is technically illegal. I mean, once you've kind of been an anarchist for a while that doesn't bother you so much because everything's freaking illegal it seems so <laughs> <I> know, <right? laughs> it's it usually just comes down to the more practical question of am i actually going to get arrested for this <laughs> right <laughs> so in this case the answer seems to be a pretty clear no as long as you're not retarded about it um, there right. are doulas and midwives and there there is sort of an underground network of people that do the home births and things like that so there is a support system in place if you you know put in a few extra minutes to look for it so so wait, wait so i assume if, if it's since it's technically illegal then there's no like um technical license for 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 a midwife right it's just like I'm not really sure somebody what knows, somebody there is knows somebody all. like it's just like that. Yeah, I'm not sure what all the certification is and how it compares to the US. Okay. Uh, like there are certified midwives that are acknowledged by the community as being reputable and there is mm -hmm. sort of a vetting infrastructure in place for that, but mm -hmm. not for doulas. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, we went with a a good reputable uh, midwife that speaks English. She's originally from England, actually, and has been here for quite a while. And then we also got a local doula in just to help out. And I mean, it really wasn't complicated. I mean, obviously, from the woman's perspective, it's difficult. Mm. But in terms of complication, it all went very smoothly for the most part, which is great. I mean, that's that that's really why we have the help. It is in case something goes wrong. Yeah. Like you want to want somebody with experience to be able to spot and and notice that something's going wrong, so that right. you can jump on it. To get, right. You know, to, to the hospital if if you have to. Fortunately, there weren't any problems like that, and. It was a very long labor, though. Holy smokes. I think it was like 39 hours or something like that from the first contractions. But So was she able to go to sleep in that time? Or, or you? Uh, I, yeah. I think she got some sleep, but mm -hmm. not not a lot, obviously, because you're yeah, anxious and everything. Right, but, right. Yeah. Yeah, and I so, mean. Yeah. Go, go ahead, go ahead. No, I mean, we just put like a mattress on the floor here next, like close to the bathroom and out she came <laughs> that's 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 great yeah my um yeah so i have two kids and my first one was um it was a water birth we had the same midwife same same doula for both and a uh, woman was like um she, she's in her 60s 
um, and uh, she she birthed like over three thousand kids, something like that. Three, like a lot, a lot. <laughs> yeah, like she's been she's been busy, and she's been doing it for like thirty years. And so her C-section rate is like, I don't know, 1%, which is amazing. You know, most hospitals are like one-third, oh, yeah. C- one-third C-section. She's terrible for that. Yeah. And so, um, and she even birthed her own grandchildren, which is pretty cool. She, her daughter lives in California. She, she's in New York. And, and, uh, and she only wanted her mother to come and help her birth her baby, <laughs> which is pretty wow. amazing. Um, yeah, so it's pretty cool. And, um, and so we, we were in a hospital a water birth facility in the hospital. So it was like a separate birthing room, not like, you know, like factory style, you know, one woman next to the other. No, it was like separate room. Lights were dimmed and it was very calming and quiet and <clears throat> it was very beautiful. But but yeah, we just didn't like being in the hospital. You know, the fact that they take your baby away and they, you don't know what they're doing and I don't like that. So, so yeah, the second one was definitely at home and uh, and water birth at home is, is beautiful, you know. Um, you know, the water did so much to um, relax her contractions. Um, mm. So much so that like, before she actually got into the birthing tub, she was in the, in the bathtub and her contractions actually stopped for a while. She was so relaxed and then <laughs> and then she got scared. Oh no, the contractions stopped. And she got out of the water and they started up again. Um, oh wow. But, uh, but yeah, she, she really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, no problems, just like you. No complications really, just came out quite smoothly. Um, it's just a beautiful experience, you know, and uh I actually, uh, I, I think, I think I told you, I did. I used to do stand-up comedy. Did I ever tell you that? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I actually, I had a few jokes uh, about um, the water birth, <laughs> and uh, yeah, of course, with my kids and my wife. But like what, the one joke about my the the, the home birth is like. Um, it was very beautiful. I took a lot of pictures nobody will ever see. And uh, and, th- and that's basically... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. But, um, go ahead. Oh, yeah. This is this is stuff they don't show you in all those <laughs> midwife shows or ER shows or whatever. Like the actual head popping out and that content little look on their face while they're suspended half, half in and half out. And yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like, and the water birth uh, is pretty amazing in that you know so many so many people think you know what what if the baby drowns you know but um but the baby goes right. from a liquid environment Where into do you a think liquid... she's been this whole time I know exactly <laughs> liquid environment to liquid environment and it's just amazing you know it just comes out yeah. it's so smooth um but yeah um highly I highly every, every time I talk to a woman and and I try to and, and they tell me they're gonna have a hospital birth you know I tell them about our, my experience and my wife's experience and try to yeah. get them to. Uh, appreciate that because it can be a really beautiful thing so many women are driven by fear you know oh absolutely fear that so many people the obstetrician the media puts Mm -hmm. into the you know about home birth is dangerous and things like that well and just for the sake of drama like any tv show that involves a birth whatever something always goes wrong right yeah (laughs) just for the sake of keeping it interesting and exciting and stuff like they don't portray it act accurately and but i mean we actually went and checked out the hospital just you know so we were familiar with it in case something did go wrong and, mm-hmm. and whatever and i mean it was not a friendly hospitable looking place yeah <laughs> so, no. so it was it was pretty clear that yeah this is not the way to go but I yeah mean, I, I guess it's nice that it's there in case you do need it but yeah of course yeah in case but uh but yeah let, let me actually uh rewind a little bit because i just remember my first child although we intended on having the hospital um she started going to getting contractions and they were coming so swiftly that she probably could have had the baby at home but we planned on having the hospital so the movie was like go to the hospital now and we were it was a half hour drive to the hospital and she had to hold in the baby she had to not push which is so um it didn't feel right for her it, she's like she wanted to push she had to like the doula was in the car helping her to breathe so that she would not push. Oh, it, it hurt. Um, and then once we got there, she then then she had to get on this table so that they can take her vitals. I think they took blood and they took the they they assessed the fetus like temperature and and heart rate and her heart rate and and that was an extra half hour of her not being able to push. Oh my god, it was torture. And then finally when she got in the tub like right when she got in the tub like her water broke and baby came out in another half hour <laughs> the next half hour <laughs> so Jeez, man yeah we could have definitely had that first at home and we're like why didn't we just have to <laughs> so we learned our lesson um yeah well as, as far as like things that can go wrong 
that's not so bad, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not that it went wrong. It's just that it was delaying what probably would have happened much easier. <laughs> it right. unnecessarily complicated the situation, you know? Um, yeah. And, uh, and, you know, in addition to having it at home for safety reasons, this maybe we can segue into our next topic, um, is the idea that once you're at the hospital, it's very easy for them to give their first vaccines right and uh and, and so i didn't like that i didn't like the fact that they they took your baby away like almost immediately which is like the most important time for the mother and child to bond and they right. just take the baby away and do all these tests and that's just horrible horrible um that you know these mother and child should be together from then on that's it and so um yeah. Not so, complicated, right? Yeah, yeah. And so we didn't like that either. So then the reason why we had the second baby at home. So, um, so, so yeah, well, why don't you uh, tell me about your philosophy about vaccines and how that developed? Like, like what influenced you in the way you look at vaccines today? Yeah, at first, I guess I was like most people and it's just something normal that you grow up with and you don't think about it too much and whatever. But then as you kind of get sucked down the libertarian rabbit hole of having to actually think about your principles and try to make them consistent and universally applicable and all that, then you kind of have to reevaluate everything and see how it all fits together and where the kinks in the armor are. And, and I kind of ended up just lumping it in with everything like circumcision or like uh, neutering animals and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's just cutting people or whatever without their consent and that's kind of assault so <laughs> that's not cool it's like if that if, if you want to do it to yourself that's great or if you give permission to someone else to do it for you that's awesome whatever but it's you don't just like sneak up on your friend and like castrate him because you think he should be <laughs> it's, it's, it's like the, you know what it's for the good of the herd <laughs> yeah, it's her it's like, <laughs> think about exactly. everyone else right well, I, I have a lot of debates with like anti-natalists and stuff too, who think that there are too many people in the world and it's wrong to have children and stuff. And like, mm. not even they will sneak into your bedroom and castrate you. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're uh, they're considerate with that. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, for me, um, I started formulating my opinion about it um, before I had kids. And one of the biggest uh, books that I read was um, it's by this guy, Dr. Robert Mendelson. You've heard of, heard of him? No. Uh, he wrote a book called um, How, to Raise, How to Raise Your Child in Spite of Your Doctor. And, oh. and it was a wonderful book. It was written in 1984. And he's, a, he's a, like an obstetrician, you know, standard medical guy. And, and he was practicing for like decades. And then all of a sudden he made a complete 180, kind of just like John Taylor Gatto, right? Working in the oh, system yeah, yeah. and then made right. a complete 180. And similar to John uh, Taylor Gatto, he became ostracized and he was an outlier and he was kicked out of mm -hmm. all these, um, all these groups and associations he was in. And he started writing books, denouncing his own profession, denouncing obst obst obstetrics, denouncing vaccines, denouncing, um, even um, gynecologists, like mainstream gynecologists, and uh, yeah, and he wrote. A, <laughs> it, 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 I have a couple of his books. So one is that. The other one is called um, Medical um, Malpractice, but it's it's kind of like written like it's male medical malpractice. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool. Uh, and uh, and uh, and then he's got another one, Confessions of a Medical Heretic. Awesome books. I highly recommend. Oh, wow. I think I think you would enjoy. Yeah, them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And like that's definitely true throughout the whole the whole field i mean it is a business it's an industry and you know obviously i'm a capitalist and i'm all down with industry and profit and stuff but in business in industry you have to be very conscious of where the incentives are and where they motivate people to go and what you're motivating them to do and you have to align and and set up your incentives accordingly you know based on what you want the outcome to be and in medicine here in Chile, especially, I mean, it's basically the same as the U.S. too, but the incentives are stacked against the customer in so many ways. Like the C-section right here is ridiculous because they want to get – it's like fast food. You know, They want to get you in and get you out and they want to minimize their liability and everything. So it's like they look for any excuse to just carve you open and yank that sucker out. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you have to kind of reevaluate everything and not just take things f for granted, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the, basically that book, um, it basically communicated to me that 
that most parents are empowered. Most parents know, have an intimate knowledge of their child much better than the pediatrician does. And so many parents too often hand that power over to the pediatrician and say, you know more, you know my child better than me. You, um, this is your field. So, you know, whatever, um, vaccines you want to give them is good. Whatever medication you want to give them is good, you know, so th- <laughs> and which is a complete mistake, you know. It's very, it's very sad. Mm. And, bas- and he basically says that most childhood illnesses are self-limiting, self-correcting, and are innocuous, right? <clears throat> um, right you know, right. like simple things like you know, head pain or abdominal pain or constipation or diarrhea. You know, many times have simple mm. solutions. Not all the time are they like you know a tumor or like you know strangulated intestines. You know, there's like the point zero zero one percent of cases for the most part. People panic too much and and too soon like for a fever you know they rush their child to the hospital for a fever and most of the time uh the, the hospital's like what are you doing here just go back home it's <laughs> the child is fine mm. you just wasted a hospital visit um and it's so sad that parents do that so so that's one of the things that that i i learned from that uh and so in the beginning uh and i read all the books on vaccines and everything and i kind of focused on at that time like you know what the ingredients were um, and, and how they, you know, interact with the body and not all of them are tested all at the same time. And now, now they're becoming more and more, um, you know, um, so many more vaccines are given as, as compared to when we were kids. Right. And it's just amazing the, the proliferation of vaccines that kids, you know, below the age of six, it's like, I think like today below the age of six, they, they get like 60 shots in total, something like that. Yeah. And, and many, many of those happen, uh, multiple times. In one, multiple times in one visit, one doctor visit, which is amazing, completely mm. overloading the child's immature um, immu- uh, immune system. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I focused on at that time. And then later on, my, as I learned about anarchism, volunteerism, my perspective changed to more of an, the idea of, of medical consent. And like, you know, we own ourselves and our body and what gets put into it. And as parents, you know, our children are basically extensions of us and we should have the final say in what goes in their body. Right. And also the fact of what you said in that they can't consent to it. Right. So in the same way as like, you know, circumcision or ear piercings for, for girls. I mean, I mean, technically I guess if you take out the piercing, you know, the ear, uh, part of the ear grows back, but still it's like, it's pain, (laughs) unnecessary pain. Even the ear. Well, I would, I would put ear piercings in the same category. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would also. Yeah, definitely. I would de- definitely. Uh, but yeah, tattoos, same thing. Tattoo. Oh my god. Tat- people tattoo their babies. Well, wow, that's sick. But anyway, it would be. Yeah. But hey, there are, there are cultures out there that we're not used to, and they have all kinds of weird practices that we think are nuts, but are perfectly normal to them, like female circumcision, as as right. they call it, right? But, right. Right. I mean, but that's that's the thing with principles is it it makes a lot of this a lot simpler is you don't have to study the living shit out of every single tiny mm-hmm. possible scenario because mm-hmm. the, the, the principle binds them all together and it's a, a common thread. Um, yeah, and I, I'm also like definitely not one of those people that will jump to conclusions about people's intent. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of people they'll they'll go, oh, this there's this negative outcome here. Therefore, it must be somebody trying to do something wrong to others, somebody trying to hurt others, somebody trying to profit at others' expense or prey on others or whatever, you know, it's some malevolent intent behind the action. Mm. But holy crap, like I was saying before, just doing this real estate project, like every time you have to deal with a professional or something, like we had this accountant, for instance, and he, like we were paying him for a year and at the end of that year, when it came time to do the taxes, we found out that he was doing jack shit the whole time. Hmm. And we had to hire a whole other accountant to go back and clean up his mistakes and stuff. And it's like, he wasn't out to hurt us. Like, mm-hmm. it wasn't personal. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. He was just really shit at his job. And we weren't paying him as much as some of his other clients. So his incentives were pushing him to care more about someone else. You know, it's just... Hmm. It's just incompetence. It's lack of care, lack of training, possibly in a certain thing. You know, it, there's a million reasons that a, a negative outcome can happen. It's not, it's not a conspiracy to to harm you. I mean, that's possible, but one should never jump to that conclusion. Yeah, that's a great. That's a really great point. Um, and I I um I assign that very same mentality to um 
government school teachers in the sense that a lot of people, you know, say they indoctrinate and they do, but perhaps Mm -hmm. they're not malicious. They're not, they're not willfully trying to, you know, inculcate state dogma into the kids and make them drones and all that stuff. They don't want to do that. They think they're educating, they think they're helping kids, but they're not. (laughs) Right. And I mean, we can speculate as to a bunch of underlying psychological motivators too, right? Like, one of my little pet conspiracy theories is about like why the game is set up the way it is and why people are so quick to defer um, their expertise or their, their knowledge to some authority figure or something like, like how many parents study parent study parenting before becoming a parent or after or during like almost none. Right. My parents sure didn't. Their parents sure didn't Mm. like, Maybe they glanced at an article in a magazine that was in the waiting room, but none of them said, okay, I'm having a kid in nine months. I'm going to become an expert on this Mm. (laughs) because their parents didn't and they didn't because their parents didn't. And it's so much easier just to defer your expertise or or your knowledge to somebody in a white coat, right? Mm. Then it, then it is to say, wow, my parents fucked up Mm -hmm. and I, and I, I suffered because of it. Or there was c- collateral damage because of that choice, and like it, it makes you face a lot of uncomfortable things and have uncomfortable conversations with them and all that stuff. It's so much easier just to say, "Oh, well, there's a doctor for this, or there's a teacher for this, or there's a cop over there for this." You know? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I would definitely, you know, and what you said about incentives is also another great point because, um, you know. I- People accuse those people that are against vaccines, you know, you tinfoil hat conspiracy type people, right? But the idea is if the person can be held liable for damaging the patient, for injuring the patient, I would be fine with that. I would be completely Mm. fine. But they're not. (laughs) Medical doctors Mm. can vaccinate and become 100% immune from damaging their patients and the pharmaceutical companies are 100 percent immune <laughs> from them i don't know how it is in chile but i know here there's oh, yeah. vaccine courts that they have to go to and it's very difficult to get compensation and very arduous and isn't that an amazing thing like what business can harm their customers and then become immune from litigation what kind of business model is that that's not a business model <laughs> that's called state uh, mutation. <laughs> well, yeah, just you know? just pre- pretend that there was a competitor that was set up differently, that was set up with liability insurance, and they had to be checked for all these things, and and they did have to pay out, and you know, would you not go to that competitor? Mm. Of course you would. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah, when his uh, when his um, license is on the line, his reputation is on the line, and everything is on the line. Um, all of a sudden, they treat you differently, right? Just like the guy, the, yeah. account, the accountant, you know, your symptoms are different when, you know, according mm-hmm. to how much you're paying him, right? And uh, and so, yeah, that's a major thing. And so it kind of irritates me. I, you know, I think like, um, I don't like vaccines, but that's not to say I'm against science or medicine. It's just to say that it sucks that I can't trust this thing because mm-hmm. it's been so... Um, so muddled and, you know, it's blurry, you know, when it, mm-hmm. it, when the state gets involved, you just, you don't know what's good anymore. You can't tell if it's yeah. good because it's immune to repercussion. <laughs> you know, like if the free market developed vaccines, I'm sure it would be very different, right? If the free market developed right. antibiotics, it would be very different. If the free market developed anything <laughs> free of state. Right. And if, if I had some brilliant, fantastic product for you that was so great why would i have to force it on you yeah when i when i be able to charge a whole bunch of money for it and have you voluntarily pay for it <laughs> yeah or or protect myself you know legally from from the repercussions of me harming you you know why <laughs> why would i need that if if i didn't think if i thought that it was safe right because obviously if they yeah. do need that it's not safe. <laughs> yeah. i mean there's a lot of anarcho-capitalist theorists and things like that that love to speculate on what the world would would look like Mm. if it was a free market, if there was no state. And that takes you down the rabbit hole of insurance providers competing for your business and things like that. And you have to wonder like, okay, what would that look like if, you know, one insurance provider might be really uh, protective, very conservative, 
and you know they would put cameras everywhere you know to minimize the risk to you they would put up security systems to try to protect you be kind of a nanny state insurance provider <laughs> but but the premiums would probably be a lot lower because they would be taking good care of their customers and protecting them from harm and mm. minimizing the the risk mm. and so more freedom would be a luxury almost mm. you would probably have to pay higher premiums to get insurance coverage if you want them to stay out of your house and stay out of your business and not keep tabs on you and all that kind of stuff right yeah but uh, but yeah all right so let's go on maybe to jordan peterson and uh, and what you've learned from him and how how he's affected you in uh, in the way you think well it's kind of like I, I mentioned before about cleaning your room right this is one of his taglines that he's been throwing out there a lot and bringing things back to I remember one of the first full like interviews I watched of him on Joe Rogan, I think it was, and Joe asked him, okay, at the end of the interview, what's one thing that you would tell people just t to leave them with one thought? And that's, that's what it was is <laughs> clean your room <laughs> like before, before you run out there and try to change the world, get your own house in order, you know, build, build yourself, work on your own personal development and, because we have all these, you know, kids growing up with these crazy ideas, and what, are, and some of them are probably perfectly fine. But there's so many unintended consequences to everything, especially when it's on a big scale. And now, when we have, you know, cryptocurrency technology and and communications tech and internet and everything, where we can actually influence and affect a lot of people with pretty minimal inputs, the potential for problems and unintended consequences are so much bigger. Like back in the 40s, you couldn't, you know, screw up a $20 million deal when you're still in high school. But you can now. I mean, we have ICOs. We have people like creating their own little coins to fund their startups and things like that that have tens of millions of dollars riding on them. And we have high school kids doing this without any real world experience and things like that. So it's it's kind of a powder keg in a lot of ways. But um but I mean, this whole process, too, has kind of taken me through something else that he talks about, and that is the process of becoming a fully developed in individual and how that involves going through sort of a tribalist phase, sort of a he, – he explains it as first you have to learn how to be part of a community, how to be part of a group, how to find your tribe and be a fellow tribesman. And then once you've done that, then the next step is to learn how to kind of break away from that and become a strong individual. And so I remember when I first kind of got into the libertarian community, for lack of a better term, um, I, I met and befriended the, the leader of the Canadian Libertarian Party at the time and started getting kind of politically involved and started meeting all the people in the Vancouver scene. And then I started hosting events and all that kind of stuff. Sorry about that. I just dropped the phone. But um, that was it was sort of a necessary phase. But as you develop your philosophy, as you kind of hone these ideas and iron out the kinks and you spot inconsistencies and logical fallacies and you work through them, and it's great to have that tribe. Um, having other libertarians to bat ideas around with and things mm -hmm. like that is super useful when it's kind of new to you and you're working through it. But once you start getting to the point where it's really comfortable for you and you and you have a consistent framework in place that you're happy with and there aren't any big outstanding questions left, you'll probably look around and notice that you're kind of alone for the most part. <laughs> like you'll not alone, but you'll have a, a small number of higher quality friends as opposed to a large number of lower quality friends. Oh, yeah. I love that. And that, <laughs> yeah. And so that's that's sort of an indicator that you're shifting more towards the point where you're ready to become an individual and kind of step out of the tribe mm -hmm. and stand alone. That doesn't have to mean you're alone by yourself necessarily. Hopefully, you've got a couple of other friends at that point that are on, on the same page. But there's so many little topics that all are all wrapped into one's worldview and one's perspectives and philosophy that the odds of having friends that agree about every single one of them are extremely low. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, like even my, my closest friends today, we agree on most of the big things, but I don't think I know anyone that I can say I agree a hundred percent on every little topic. Nope. 
definitely not. It's just, <laughs> yeah. So I, I really like the way he explains that process, and th- that kind of sums up my feeling about the the movement, as it as it were. I mean, the Libertarian Party, for instance, is very big tent, as they say. They include minarchists. They include you know conservative party members that just want to smoke weed and <laughs> and. Uh, and libertarianism and especially anarchism and, and anarcho-capitalism, they attract people that just kind of want a safe space to practice their particular vice <laughs> where, where they won't be judged. You know, mm-hmm. It's like, you can't judge me. I'm an anarchist. What are you, some kind of statist authority figure? Who are you trying to impose your values on me? You know, right. so that's fine. That's that's great. That's part of the process. But once you define for yourself what your values really are and what you stand for, then you start cutting yourself away from the rest of the people that don't fit that framework. And that's okay. And that that played into what Fort Galt is. I mean, it's not for everyone. It's not for every libertarian. It's I like to think of it as a higher class, a, a higher caliber, a more uh, discriminating option. If you just want a place to party and and whatever, that's fine. There's a lot of options for that. There's great festivals and things that take place and whatever. You, no one's going to worry about these things. But because Fort Galt is an actual community where people live and have to deal with each other all the time in close proximity, we have to start thinking about these other things, you know. And we have to have standards for one another. Essentially, we have to know that our neighbors are trustworthy and that they're not going to stab us in the back they're not going to do us any kind of harm that they can be trusted with our children all that kind of stuff like what kind of neighbors do you really want to have Mm -hmm. and so looking forwards i think that's what community development is going to be whether it's on a seastead or a little micro nation or just a small town kind of thing like we're doing here people are going to be gathering according to their shared values not according to accidents of birth or colors of their skin or, or whatever I mean, there might be some of that too, but I mean, what really matters to you when you're looking for a home? Mm. That's the first thing that comes to my mind is who are my neighbors? <laughs> well, I, I need people with brown eyes. Only brown eyes people can be around me. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm sure that town will exist someday. <laughs> so, so before I respond to that, I remember what I said about the vaccines, which is which is what you uh, just wanted to reiterate what you said, which was a great point. Um, when you understand your principles, um and for me that would be like self-ownership i own my body and that of my child and so Mm -hmm. i don't need really to um you know to know the specific side effects of every single ingredient or no studies determining this is linked to autism or whatever other illness no (laughs) i don't need it because because that degenerates into a whole other conversation of like no that study is flawed and (laughs) it's just like facts my facts against your facts and i don't want to get into that conversation right and like even still just the way that you phrase that kind of highlights a a minor discrepancy about the way that we probably see it too is like i would not say that i own my my child's body i would say that she owns it and I'm her service provider. I'm her. Okay, good point. <laughs> good point. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I kind of, uh, yeah, I definitely agree with that. And like, <clears throat> part of part of my job is to protect her, and right, I oh, have to do that point. to the best of my ability. Yes, I'll rephrase it, and I like the way you said better. <laughs> definitely sounds a lot better. Oh uh, yeah, that's what I meant. But um, but yes, I just wanted to say that excellent point, and uh, and so that's why that's why I I when I talk about vaccines now, I talk about freedom of medical choice basically right that's, that's what it comes down to for me <clears throat> um but uh, but yeah with jordan peterson i've been listening to him a lot more recently uh, i've uh, i've seen uh, you know, he's becoming pretty popular and uh, in the anarchists and volunteer circles and and um <clears throat> and i like that he's um you know he does focus a lot on men you know uh, on talking to oh, yeah. young men um probably because they are shunned a lot in society which is very unfortunate um and um and i think he does a great job and the whole you know tend to your you know make your room or or tend to your house um kind of reminds me of a uh, a confucius quote that i like to uh say a lot which is um you know it says if you want to if you want to improve the country first improve your town if you want to improve your town first improve your village you want to improve your village first improve your house and if you want to improve your house first improve yourself <laughs> absolutely and you know? of course 
Peterson is a Christian and there's a version of that in the Bible. You know, it, it tells you that before you try to take the speck out of your friend's eye, you should take the plank out of yours. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It all comes out. It all comes back to the individual. And, uh, you know, I guess it's a very, that, go ahead, go ahead. No, sorry. But like that concept is offensive to the general public these days, right? Because it, it, it is fundamentally at odds with socialism. Yeah, you know this this idea that you should take care of yourself first. Right. You know, pay yourself first, take care of you first. That's offensive because you're supposed to work for the greater good of right. everybody and you know, all that kind of crap, and you're supposed to sacrifice for them. Right. So, I mean, there's that's why I like Peterson really. I mean, he's he's making these underlying concepts that people don't necessarily focus on much, but mm. are underneath everything else. Like he he makes it okay to have standards and be discriminating and he, he he clearly explains like why that's a good thing you have to be discriminatory discrimination mm. is good <laughs> <laughs> you know and, right. yeah go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> but like ayn rand said these same things but she was more inflammatory you know she was more like a shit disturber she wanted to have like shock value uh. and like overturned the apple cart mm -hmm. whereas peterson's approach is an academic mm -hmm. and he's got this this you know kermit the frog voice that just sells everything as <laughs> so gentle right, and true. like <laughs> self-evident and and he's also open e emotionally in things and mm -hmm. even in 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 an interview if he hasn't thought about a question or whatever he'll stop and think about it he, mm -hmm. he won't just come up with bullshit answers to pass the time he's <laughs> yeah, you know right. he'll say hmm I've, I've never thought about that let's hang on a minute hmm i'm not really sure you know he'll he'll admit when he doesn't know something or right, right. <laughs> so just that, that that was kind of a breath of fresh air when it kind of came on the, the scene i think because it's not what everyone else is doing yeah yeah and, and um i mean i've never heard of him describe himself as a libertarian or or even an anarchist no. but uh, but it definitely a lot of the things that he espouses um do tend to have that flavor um but uh yeah he's uh yeah he's really he's really done a lot of great work and um you know i think i did it did it all start like when he was like um like like made famous by that whole thing with uh the what is it he he spoke out against the pronoun law thing right in canada oh yeah that was that was that was beautiful i mean he's been at this a long ass time he's yeah. been a professor saying these things forever but mm. no one like it took camera phones essentially it, it took smartphones mm -hmm. and it took his opponent trying to smear him and trying to make him look bad to make him famous. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what's Whoever that? shot that video must be kicking their own ass every single day right now. <laughs> <laughs> if it weren't for them shooting that footage, no one would have ever heard of him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Isn't it, isn't it amazing? I think he makes like like fifty thousand dollars on Patreon a month, something like that. Oh, like easy. people, people easy. love him. Like, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, I mean, I, I, what did he did he get kicked out of the college that, or the university that he was in, or, or like? What, what? I don't know what the technicalities are on that. Um, he got reprimanded. He got a couple of warning letters because you know that's how human resources works. They have to build a case first. Mm. They can't just fire you on, on the spot because they don't like what you said. They have mm. to give you warnings. They have to document your responses and build up a case. So yeah. I think he was just kind of made uncomfortable and. It was made clear that his opinions weren't super welcome, you know, all yeah. that kind of stuff. But I don't think he was ever like officially fired. Right, right. Yeah, you know the the idea of um, trying to reform others and trying to tell others how they should live their lives is is really the essence of statism, you know. And, oh, yeah. and so many people around me who think that they are doing good in the world by advocating for more gun laws, more business regulations, mm. more taxes, and they think. Uh, that they're doing a good job or by voting for this person who's going to, mm. you know, steal more from the rich, you know, and, and they think that, that, that they feel morally righteous for doing that. <laughs> um, and it's just amazing how, um, you know, as, as sometimes I like to ask them, um, what, um, what behavior would you like the state to forcibly prevent you from doing <laughs> or or to force you to do <laughs> you know because <clears throat> that's essentially what you're doing to other people right when you when you advocate for oh, any, yeah. any state action 
And like I was saying earlier, once you start developing an intentional community, your brain starts wiring itself a little differently. Like when you're living in the U.S. or Canada or, or just a speck amongst a larger state that dominates you, mm. you just kind of conform and you're, you're told that you can try to affect change in the greater community of millions and millions of people by voting a certain way or putting out YouTube videos or doing some tiny little thing to try to shift the sands of pu public uh, opinion a certain direction. And we all know that's pointless. I mean, we try it once or twice or these people who call themselves activists might try it a hundred thousand times. I don't friggin' know. But personally, after I tried a few times, I was like, wow, this is super pointless. My time is worth more than this. <laughs> and so you start focusing on your own house. You start focus. And when you start gathering others to your community and building an intentional little place where things make sense, the rest of the world takes on a very different look, I guess, aesthetic, it, it starts to look like enemy territory, you know, <laughs> like when I'm with my friends, when I'm at Fort Galt or, or whatever, it feels like home. It feels like safe place. It, it feels like friendly territory. But when I go out to the big city and I'm wandering around and there's cops everywhere and people that want to vote to take away my freedoms and they, like that does not feel like home. That feels like I'm venturing behind enemy lines into mm. a hostile land. <laughs> yeah, and and it's um, to me it embodies the difference between um, saying that you're you know anti-state, anti-war, anti-politician, anti you know man-made law, which we all are, but and you know not just saying that, but also saying that you are you know pro-family and pro-love mm. and pro cooperation and pro business and pro entrepreneurship, which is a beautiful thing. And I think a lot of anarchists and volunteers would do well to not just focus on what they're against, but actually state what they are for and what they advocate. And, and that's exactly yeah. what you're doing. You're living it, <laughs> you know, and, and pro pro legitimate authority too. Right. Because yeah. as you know, it's, as anarchists, we're, we're quick to point out all the illegitimate authority, but right. we forget that some of it is perfectly legitimate, too, as long as it's voluntary. Right, sure. You know? <laughs> and, you know, when you start packaging all that in kind of a framework and you put a name on it, it looks an awful lot like feudalism almost. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, we're for private property. Property's good. Um, we're, we're all in favor of people voluntarily joining other people and working for them and living in a privately owned community. Isn't that a castle? Mm -hmm. Isn't the property owner a lord? <laughs> like, yeah. wasn't this done? What wasn't this normal? Well, once upon a time, right, you know? right, right. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a it's a good distinction. Also, the difference between a leader and a ruler, and yeah. uh, you know the uh, in terms of the the ruler, you know, um, rules by force and by mandate and by dictate and and tells people what to do and punishes punishes them if they disobey, whereas mm -hmm. a ruler leads oh sorry a leader leads by example right in the front right mm -hmm. you know leads ahead uh, and shows the way what should be done and you can either follow or not follow right and that's it and that's all that's all and he, go ahead yeah and and it's important to know who owns what you know like if if the land is all owned by one dude mm. then yeah of of course he rules it you know mm. if he's if he's letting you camp on his land you don't automatically own his land now. Right. I mean, come on, you're right. a guest, a guest in his house, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you, like, one might sloppily say that he he rules you. Well, no, he just rules his own property, and yeah. you want to hang out there for a while. It's like, yeah, okay, whatever, and <laughs> you can work out some kind of a private deal with him, like rent a piece of his land from him, as long as you agree to abide by his rules or something like that, and like. As long as he owns a property, I, I see no problem with it. It's it's this illegitimate authority of people just voting themselves into positions of power over others and things like that. That's where we have a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Well, well, great conversation. I don't want to take you too much. I know you have a little baby over there. Got to tend to. Uh, she is ridiculously quiet at the moment. I don't know how <laughs> Tanisha is pulling that off. But. Maybe it's the sound of our talking about volunteers when anarchism is lulling her to sleep. <laughs> Excellent. The, 
L- lullaby of reason. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, yeah, so uh, before we go, just uh, reiterate um, the ways that people can reach you if they want to follow what you're doing. Uh, I, if you want to send me an email, I am gabriel at fortgalt.com. Of course, the website is fortgalt.com. There's also cryptacademy.com. Um, I'm on Facebook, Skype, LinkedIn, whatever. Like, I'm out there. I'm not hard to find. <laughs> Awesome. So I know I asked you this last time, but it's been a few years. Uh, maybe it's changed. What is your favorite quote of all time these days? <laughs> I guess be the change you want to see in the world is still great. I I, I kind of mentioned before how I just absolutely hate the phrase change the world. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> of all of the assumptions that are baked into it. Right. But that's, that, that's kind of the antidote to that. It, it's not that you are trying to change the world. Being the change means that you are cleaning your, your own room rather yeah. than trying to clean everyone else's. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the first. Actually, the first thing I thought of when you mentioned um, clean your room is it's a variation of be the change, you know. Um, yeah. And that's definitely very, very admirable because, um, you know, that's. I mean, that's that's why I tell people what I do. It's all I do is I just talk about. Um, you know, philosophy, and morality, and economics, and entrepreneurship, and business, and you know, trying to educate people. That's how I try to. That's that's what I do to try to improve the world. That's it. You know, and not it's a, telling, go, go ahead. And it's a full time job. I mean, if you're actually being the change that you want to see, you have no time to run around trying to change everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm uh, you know I'm still learning, and I, and I I love you know when I interview fascinating people and I learn new things, and you know, so I'm I'm constantly learning. Um, and you know, I think I think in order to um, in order to be a better person, you have to be open to uh, you know improvement and and saying you know what I didn't think about that maybe I was wrong you know show me show me a different path and and I think that's one of the things that distinguishes volunteers and anarchists in general is that most of them are um, very very humble in that in order to have reached this point we had to have uh, reconsidered our pre existing notions about what we understood about business and the economy and politics and government, right, in order to reach this assumption, right? So many people do not reconsider those things that they were brought up to believe. And I think that that takes an amazing amount of willpower and humility. So, Great note to wrap it up on. Yes. <laughs> awesome <laughs> conversation, Gabe. I really appreciate it. Um, so, if, uh, so if anybody wants to follow him, please do. He's doing some amazing stuff down there in Chile. Help him out. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, so this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theseasofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the BitCot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. 
Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.